Right. Well, hello and welcome to Body Image Care for Cancer Survivors, Best Practices for Assessment and Treatment, presented by Dr. Michelle Fingret, PhD, FAPOS. My name is Devin Schultes, Program Manager of Development and Delivery at Cancer Support Community, and I'll be moderating this session today. Before I introduce our presenter, we want to review a few housekeeping items to cover. First, this session is being recorded and will be available for viewing after today's event. However, continuing education credits can only be earned by attending this session live. If you wish to receive a continuing education credit from participating in this session, you must complete an online evaluation form, the link to which will be made available at the end of the symposium later today. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please do so using the Q&A feature in Zoom. While some questions may be addressed during the session, we will do our best to address all remaining comments and questions during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. To turn on closed captions, please click on the CC button in the Zoom toolbar. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Michelle Fingeret is a licensed psychologist with 20 years of experience specializing in body image and cancer. She obtained her PhD in clinical psychology at Texas A&M University in 2004 and completed her postdoctoral training at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Fingeret was a faculty member at MD Anderson for 10 years where she developed the only program of its kind in the US focused on addressing body image issues for cancer survivors through a combination of research, patient care services, and educational activities. She's published over 50 peer-reviewed research articles, has been awarded numerous grants from the National Cancer Institute and the American Cancer Society, and created the first and only academic textbook on body image care for cancer patients. She's a fellow and former president of the American Psychosocial Oncology Society, Dr. Fingeret founded the Fingeret Psychology Services in 2017 to further her work in body image education and support for oncology healthcare professionals and cancer survivors. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Fingeret. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, we're going to get right into it. I uh, don't have any financial relationships to disclose. Uh, what we're going to do today is um, first going to start off with just a little kind of body image 101, defining the term and the construct. It's actually um, pretty complex and multidimensional. I really hope you're going to get a, a different viewpoint on body image today maybe than you've had before. I want to talk very specifically about ways to approach conversations about body image. This is meant to be very practical, things you can go and use in the clinic exam room today, tomorrow. Um, and then I also wanna give you some basics around body image assessment and some treatment strategies as well. First thing I'd like to do though, is I'd like to, I'd like to get a sense of who's on the call today. Um, I do a lot of this work with multidisciplinary audience. So I'd like to just gauge um, who's here. Um, obviously some people are later gonna watch this online, so I won't know who you are, but if you're here live today, please let us know what um, your professional discipline is. Looks like we've got all, we've got a lot of people who've participated in the poll, a few more, and then we can end the poll and see where we are. But that'll help me today in some of what I'm saying. Okay. I don't know if these results pop up for me or if the moderator is able to see them, but um, looks like social workers and psychologists are here today and some other folks as well. So welcome everyone. Um, I will tell you that this is a type of talk that I often give to nurse navigators or oncology nurses, as well as physicians, physician assistants, psychiatrists. These are all odd professional audiences that I um, will address this very important topic with of body image. Let's see if I can move forward the slides. Okay, 
So here's what we're going to do today. There's some really important questions to consider, and I want you to think about this as you're, as you're sitting, you know, in your space and you're thinking about your work. I want you to really think about why body image is such an important psychosocial issue for cancer patients, and I'm going to address that. It's actually really important for us as psychosocial providers to be able to make this argument in this case to our other medical uh, healthcare colleagues that we're working with on our treatment team, so we need to be able to make the case about why this is important. Um, I want you to ask yourself, which of your patients seems to struggle the most with body image issues? Is there any sort of a predictable pattern in your own mind where a patient comes in and you um, can anticipate that they're going to have these issues? Are there times where it comes about and you're kind of surprised that you wouldn't have been able to predict it in advance? Um, we'll talk about that today. I want you to ask yourself, when are you seeing body image issues present? Um, is, it, is it at the beginning of treatment when people are coming in in that preoperative or that pretreatment phase right after diagnosis? Are you seeing this later on? Um, there's lots of different time points that body image issues can present, and we'll talk about why that's the case. And I want you to think about how do these issues affect your patients? What are you seeing in the clinic? Um, what is your day-to-day -day experience? And I want you to think about how are you typically addressing these concerns with your patients? Are there are there things you're saying repeatedly? Is there kind of a script that you have about how you address body image? Or do you really not have much of the language or you, you struggle with addressing that? Um, I'm obviously here today to help give you some ways to address it, some different ways to think about it. Or I might be here to just help reinforce some of what you're already doing and help you do it in a more mindful way, in a more intentional way. I think there's a lot of things I'm going to talk about on today's call that are very familiar concepts to those of you who are working in the field but you might not have kind of a framework for how to do this um, in a structured way. And then, of course, the question is, what more could you be doing to help patients? I'm assuming the reason why you're here is because there's more that you want to learn. So now we're going to have a little bit of an open-ended question here. I want to know what are some common types of body image concerns you address as part of cancer care? Um, this is an open-ended um, anything goes here. I'm going to have our moderator in a minute share some of those results, um, just like a summary. I don't need to know every single answer, but I'm curious to know, um, for those of you who are here, what are you seeing in your everyday practice? And thank you for participating in the poll. Devin, whenever you're ready, you can give us just a little highlight or overview of what you're seeing in the Absolutely. Answers. I still see a ton of answers coming in, so I'm just going to hold off for one second until it slows down just a tiny bit. All right. Okay. Some things I'm seeing are no longer feeling feminine. Um, hair loss, weight loss, weight gain, loss of femininity again, not recognizing themselves in the mirror. Um, let's see. Physical features that are a major identity point being lost. Breast size is changing after surgery, hair loss, more change in weight not liking the way that their body has changed post-cancer, clothes not quite fitting right, shame around the fact that they're concerned about their body image, scars or missing body parts from surgery, a perceived loss of identity, having to conceal, and many more around the loss of hair, weight loss, changes in their body. Thanks. Absolutely. If, if anything, while I'm listening to this, I'm just nodding my head kind of vigorously. And I bet all of you who are on the call, there's this real sense of commonality here of what we're hearing. Um, so I think um, it's, it's hard to hear because it's hard to hear that our, you know, our patients that we're working with are suffering and struggling with this. But as we know, um, there's, there's so much commonality around this that we, we need better training and some more support as healthcare professionals of how to best address this. 
Um, okay, I'm trying to see if, okay, advancing my slides. So what I really do want to start at the very beginning. How do we define body image? Let's get, let's get a working definition of this. Um, there's many aspects to it. I would say that at a very basic level, it's the personal relationship that you have with your body. It's personal and it's private. And that's really important, I think, for us to put as that framework. Um, if you look in the literature, I've defined this again and again, as many other professionals have, in a very multidimensional way. It's about the way you perceive, think, and feel about all aspects of your body. So what's really critical, and I know we've heard a lot about weight loss, weight gain, scars, um, hair loss, breast changes, is it's more than just your physical appearance, right? Appearance is a very important component of body image, but it's more than just what you see when you look in the mirror. There was a lot around just femininity and a feminine identity, right? Um, but we have to understand that body image issues um, extend to aspects of sensory experiences as well as functional experiences of the body. So when we think about it in that broad way, we realize that um, there are many different ways that cancer patients are touched by body image changes that go beyond just appearance. And one thing I will tell you is that the literature is very clear that it is not the necessarily visible changes or the extent of scarring or the extent of disfigurement that predicts how somebody adjusts to body image changes. That's not the most important thing, and we'll talk about what that is. At the very heart of the concept of body image is the completely subjective nature of it. This is about what our patients perceive and how they experience their bodies. And what we know is that there can often be a disconnect, not only between how the patient experiences their own body and we as healthcare professionals perceive their bodies, but between patients and their loved ones, patients and acquaintances, patients and friends. And what we're really trying to do is understand this from the patient's perspective and know that we're not gonna see it the same way that they are. Um, another aspect of body image that's also really important to understand is that it's not static. It changes over time. It changes with different experiences. It can fluctuate throughout the day. Um, there's lots of things that affect the way one experiences their own bodies. So what are some of those? Obviously, um, we know that gender influences body image, age, actual physical characteristics. Um, if you're working with a patient in a more in-depth uh, therapy situation, you might want to talk with them more about cultural beliefs and family messages around body image will help shape their body image prior to cancer. Peer influences, obviously we all know about the um, influence of the mass media and social media around body image. But of course, when we're working in the field that we do, it's understanding that we now have on top of all of this, an external event, which is cancer and its treatment that is further affecting how people are experiencing body image. So I asked you an open-ended question before about what are the common types of body image issues you're seeing? Obviously many of them are listed here, um, but the ones that really weren't mentioned as much were things like sensory changes or neuropathy, pain, tingling, numbness. That loss of sensation is something that it's not just always for breast cancer patients, the way the breast looks, it's the way the breast feels. Um, things like decreased physical strength and stamina can be a real challenge. I work a lot in the head and neck area, and I work a lot with patients who've had alterations to speech and swallowing. That is a body image change. It's very, and it's not something that's necessarily visible, it's functional. But um, and a lot of the work that I've done, even in um, the book that I published around um, body image care for cancer patients, there's a whole chapter devoted to addressing functional changes. So um, there's lots of ways that we you know, need to understand body image and how it affects our patients and know that the more of these types of changes a patient has, the, that compounds the problem, right? Um, so just also from a conceptual framing perspective, you know, I tell people, Every cancer survivor undergoes a, a process of body image adaptation. Why is body image important? Because it affects every single one of our patients. Now, I'm not here to suggest that every patient has significant distress or that the body image is significantly impairing their functioning day to day. Um, some people actually can adjust well or have positive growth. They view their scars as a badge of honor. It's, it's not always a negative experience. It's, it, it's often... Um, complex. There's negative aspects to it. There might be positive aspect to it. But at the basic level, everybody undergoes some sort of process of adaptation. Something changes in their bodies, and they need to find ways to adjust to that. Um, I've mentioned this before, but the research is very clear. Body image concerns are not based on the location or the extent of the cancer. Therefore, we cannot automatically predict who's going to come in with body image changes based on the visible nature of what's happening or the extent of their cancer. 
Um, what we know from literature is that things like dispositional style, referring to optimi a sense of optimism or pessimism, that is, a that is a consistent predictor of adjustment to body image changes. We know that sociocognitive factors, such as one's perceptions of social support or social acceptance, or fears of negative evaluation, those internal processes are much more of a predictor of adjustment. And as well as appearance-specific cognitions, um, the importance or value someone places on their appearance, the degree to which what their ideal is of how they want to look or how they want their body to function is discrepant from the reality, as well as um, engaging in a lot of social comparison. Those are really the things that help us better understand and set apart our patients who are going to have difficulties adjusting to body image changes or not. I've talked to a lot of my healthcare colleagues and explained you can have two patients with the same exact type of cancer, extent of cancer, same physical changes, and one will, could adjust very different than another. We all know this. We all know that it's an individual experience. We sometimes have to be reminded of that, though, um, when we're thinking. I think what it does is there's a lot of people who might struggle or suffer with body image that we're not always attuned to. And that's because, as someone else also mentioned um, in one of their open-ended responses, people can be experience a lot of shame, guilt, and embarrassment around having body image changes, and they might be very reluctant to admit this to their healthcare providers, right? The stigma around this, especially to their to their doctors or nurses or people whom they're really relying on for support, they don't want to seem as if they're vain. And they don't want to seem as if they're ungrateful for everything the healthcare team is doing. And we really need to help them understand that body image concerns are completely normal and to be expected. And we should be framing our interactions with them and we should be teaching our other healthcare colleagues about how to do that, okay, about how to be able to bring this out in the open and normalize and validate all body image concerns. Even those that are extreme, I tell, if the, if the body image concerns are very extreme, and I'll talk about that in a minute about what that looks like, the fact that they're having concerns about their body image is normal and to be expected, right? We also know that body image concerns can arise before, during, or after cancer treatment, and I'm going to talk today about different treatment strategies you might use when you're dealing with anticipatory anxiety around body image or you're dealing with acute postoperative changes or treatment, you know, acute body image changes during active treatment, or whether it's later on that these body image concerns come about. We need to remain vigilant that, that some of our patients may come into this process, not focus on body image changes at all, don't have anticipatory anxiety around that, because they're focused a little bit more on, you know, their prognosis and survival and all of that. And it's later on when these body image issues come about, we need to be vigilant as healthcare providers, because we could miss an opportunity to intervene and help provide support if we've, if we've not been paying attention to the fact that there's a late onset of these body image issues. Patients, it sometimes really surprises them. Why am I worried about this now? I shouldn't be focusing on this. Sometimes it's at the end of a reconstructive process where they've gone through and been coping very well. And all of a sudden at the end, they say, oh, wait, I really am not satisfied and I'm really struggling with this. We need to be able to normalize and validate that and help bring that to the forefront. Even if a patient doesn't acknowledge it right away, we need to be having those proactive conversations hey, it's the end of treatment. Some people do experience kind of some disappointment at this point. How are you feeling about your body image? Things like that. Um, so as we kind of go through some of it as understanding, you know, these changes can come about gradually or they can be acute. Obviously, like with a surgery where you wake up and you're different than there's a massive body image change compared to what it was like um, before you went to, before the anesthesia. T body image changes can be temporary. They could be more long lasting. Obviously, a lot of this is um, unpredictable. Um, and it, w whether the body image changes are visible or not visible, whether they're temporary or long lasting, gradual or acute, it doesn't matter any of these features or characteristics. These body image issues need to be addressed at all phases and stages even those temporary ones, right? I think we all have experienced some challenges with hair loss, for example, and people really um, minimizing that as, oh, it'll grow back. We don't do that as healthcare professionals, but I think people in, we have to support our patients where their social circle or their peer circle or other people are giving them those messages. And we need to say, no, even temporary body image changes, it's okay to be concerned about them. It's okay to be distressed. Let's help you work through this. Let's provide support, all of that, okay? So here is a framework that I want you all to think about. Um, when you have any individual patient, where are they on this continuum, right? What we expect is that all patients 
um, I'm sorry, the majority of patients are going to be in the middle. They're going to have average or normal body image concerns. What does that look like? They might have mild or moderate difficulties adjusting to changes, which means they may have intrusive thoughts about their body image concerns um, during the day or, you know, throughout the week. They, they're likely to feel self-conscious in social situations, and we have to remind them that this is normal and to be expected. Um, they may have experienced, uh, they may experience difficulties at times coping with body changes, but they're likely to have more realistic expectations, and they're likely to still go out and do things that they enjoy doing, even if it's with distress, okay? And I always want to highlight that these patients very much can benefit from having brief supportive therapy interventions. And I think a lot of times these are the patients that get missed because the healthcare team is not um, really thinking they're having any uh, enough challenges that it warrants a referral or things like that. And I've kind of explained these, these are the patients that are, uh, can really benefit tremendously from some brief therapy. Most of the time as healthcare uh, psychosocial providers, we're getting those patients who are on the extreme end patients who are preoccupied with intrusive thoughts about body image constantly. They're engaging in frequent um, social avoidance or isolation due to their body image concerns. They're having significant levels of depression or anxiety. And we know that a lot of these patients may experience very unrealistic expectations for their cosmetic and functional outcomes. And these patients are likely to benefit from more intensive therapy. Um, and this is where I say, even if a patient is having very extreme body image concerns, I still find ways to normalize with them. The fact that you're having these concerns is normal. The way they're affecting your life is very extreme or intense, and we need to help you work through that to how you can live your day-to-day -day life without having these body image concerns um, interfere with your day-to-day -day life. But still, at the heart of it is normalizing the fact that they're concerned about body image changes is okay um, and normal. Now, at the other end, we can't ignore these people at the other end who say, I'm not concerned about body changes, right? I have had, I've worked with men with head and neck cancer who've said, you know, I'm ugly. I was ugly before. I'm going to be ugly after. I don't really care. And that could be that they're not invested in their appearance, and this really isn't affecting their day-to-day their -day life. Or it could be a defense mechanism, and they actually are feeling quite a bit of shame and embarrassment and guilt around having body image concerns, especially as a man. Um, and we need to be able to understand that if they're minimizing their concerns because of that shame or embarrassment, or they're reluctant to admit, what can we do as healthcare professionals to make a safe space for them to be able to acknowledge and admit the way this is affecting them, right? So I kind of typically will walk into a patient's room and explain from the outset um, I'm a body image specialist. What that means is I work with people who might have concerns um, about changes to their body, uh, changes to their appearance or changes to their body functioning. And I want you to know that it's normal and natural for most head and neck cancer patients are going to have those concerns at some point or most breast, you know, if you're a breast cancer patient. So I, I bring that as part of my introductory conversation. And whether you're, I mean, I'm saying that we have psychologists and social workers here, but this is what I tell my, nur my nursing colleagues and my physician assistant and my physician colleagues is to be able to frame that conversation of um, part of what they do is addressing body image in, in their work. So this is the framework for what I call the three C's about how to approach conversations with body image. The first is this one, common. It's very common to have concerns about body image changes, right? I, I, I make this as a statement, okay? Before I start exploring what, if any, concerns are you having, that's the next step. Because I want to be able to lay the groundwork to say, by the way, it'd be normal if you had these concerns. In fact, it'd be kind of most people, if I've said to them, if you're not having these concerns, you're actually in the minority, right? The majority are going to have the concerns. And then I go into the next C, what, if any, concerns are you having? And I ask this obviously using my open-ended framework, and I want to know if they're having concerns about appearance changes, sensory changes, or functional changes. And I also want to know what concerns are you having right now of things that have already happened to you, to your body, or what concerns do you have about what's going to happen? You want to ask it in the present, and you want to ask it in the future tense, right? And then you also want to understand what are the consequences or impact that these body image concerns are having on your daily life. How is this affecting you at work? How is this affecting you, you know, at home in your relationship with your partner, with your spouse? Um, how is this affecting you emotionally? Okay. And I've told many colleagues of mine, many of you are not just here to address body image, right? I've, what I do in my practice is I actually see that's like my specialty area. I will 
pretty much work with people whose primary focus is addressing, the primary presenting problem is body image issues. Many of you that are going to be dealing with more than one thing in your work, you can have this conversation in as easy as, you know, five minutes or less, three minutes or less. It's just about going through this piece. This doesn't have to be a prolonged conversation. Um, you can find ways to fit that in as part of a checklist of maybe other things you need to ask about. So I'd encourage you to think about that. Here's kind of my little body image 101, if I could do that today, is again, reminding patients that they're not alone. I think we all know the power of helping patients realize that the concerns that they are having, many other patients have, who have come before them have had those concerns, and many other patients who come after them are going to have those concerns. If I had a dollar for every time somebody said, you mean I'm not the only one who feels this way? Um, and I think probably many of you might be nodding your heads along as I say that. Um, another part of this is to really help emphasize to our patients that body image is meaningful and important. You know, I just gave a whole um, training like this to some of my colleagues in the plastic surgery department. And all of the, you know, they're, they're obviously doing reconstructive surgery on cancer patients. And of course, that's their whole work is to try to restore form and function. That's like the core of what they're doing is restoring somebody's body image. Of course, it's meaningful. Of course, it's important. Um, and, and again, reminding patients that body image concerns can arise at any point. Um, so what we want to do is maybe focus on what are some things not to say. And I kind of asked, you know, this has been my observation going into different healthcare um, settings where I'm working with cancer patients and I might be interacting with a team. And oftentimes what I hear many of the medical providers come in and say, and it's true for psychosocial providers too, the first thing they say when they greet a patient, a patient walks in the room is, you look great. You look so good. Um, and I, I tell you that for a patient who's struggling with body image changes or appearance changes, that can that can sometimes very much, as you might imagine, shut them down from wanting to admit, no, I don't feel like I look good, or I'm really struggling with my hair loss, or I'm struggling with my weight, or whatever it is. Um, I think we want to be really careful about that very well-meaning, automatic kind of comment, because they're not only hearing it from us, they're hearing it from everybody in their world, too. Everybody wants to be very positive and very kind of cheerleading about how great they're doing. So I ask you to take a step back if you find yourself saying that sometimes and really understand that the impact that that can have. So another way to approach it is I'm so happy to see you today. Um, it's so great, you know, that I get to see you today or something like that. And that's something I actually encourage patients to tell their friends and family. But what we want to do is we want to be able to explore with the patient first, how are, you, how, how are you coping and adjusting to these body image changes? What is your experience like? We want to be able to empathize with them. We really want to be able to hear from them how their internal subjective body image experience is, and then we can do some educating around the positive nature of their outcomes. If their scars are healing well, um, if things are improving, of course we want to be able to educate them on those things, but you don't want to lead with that. You always want to lead with exploring and evaluating where the patient is. You want to be able to reflect on what they're saying before you reassure them, okay? So I would say that, um, you know, that's one thing I really talk with people a lot. Of course, I'm asking you to be proactive about starting the conversation around body image and not waiting for the patient to tell you how they're experiencing or feeling things. I can kind of give you one clinical example. I had a patient who had a forehead flap and had her bangs covering that forehead flap, and it was very well healed, and we're kind of months into things. We were working in the reconstructive surgery center at that point. And um, her outcomes objective, like from an objective, my objective perspective were very positive and she had been healing well. And when I started talking to her and exploring her how she's feeling about the body image changes, she acknowledged to me that she hadn't left the house for four months and she couldn't look in the mirror. And nobody on the team had any idea. Um, and part of it was she didn't want to tell her surgeon that, you know, because she was very grateful for everything that he had been doing, um, but she was really struggling and really struggling. By having this conversation, exploring this way, I was really able to understand the consequences for her and how that was affecting her. Um, a few other things on here. When I talk about exploratory phases, phrases, I can give you some other examples of, of things that are helpful to have um, to be able to ask people, well, what do you see when you look in the mirror? What, what do you see? Or what do you see when you look at your, um, the affected area? And a lot of times what we want to do as psychosocial providers, and I think you know this, is we 
are very attuned to the language that people are using to describe their body image or their appearance changes. Patients can use very dark, negative uh, words around this, right? Talk about themselves looking like a monster or having franken boobs or being a fat cow or whatever it is. Um, we really want to be attuned to that language of how a patient is describing those changes. That provides a lot of information about how we might go about some clinical interventions. Um, tell me more about what this is like for you. I am right now telling you things you already know. I'm just reminding you of some of these phrases that can be really helpful. Obviously, we want to know from patients, what are you most concerned about? What's top of mind? How is this holding you back? Um, how is this different than what you were expecting, right? And a big part of this, and I don't think I have to tell the psychosocial providers on this call, but I do have to do this sometimes with my other um, colleagues, is avoid the temptation to challenge or contradict the patient's views on their own body image, right? That obviously can be very invalidating and dismissing, dismissive. And, you know, basics, basics 101. We want to use reflective listening to demonstrate that we're generally attentive to their viewpoint. Um, it can be very helpful for us to remember to label the patient's emotions, to help them assist them in identifying their emotions and articulating their emotional response, whether it's grief or shame or anger or fear, disappointment. Um, you know, and we obviously want to allow the expression of those emotions in whatever way they're going to come out in the session and, and in our interactions. So again, I'm reminding you of things, but um, they're important things for us to, to keep in mind, especially within this context. So here is, a, here is what I do in my body image assessment when I'm working with a patient. I want to know the answers to these questions. If you could only pick out a few of these, I think I've ordered them in where I might focus my effort and energy if body image is only a portion of what you're doing in a clinical session or in a clinical assessment. But we want to understand the importance of the meaning of the body part that's being affected. Um, and what I tell patients all the time, I do patient talks where I talk with them about body image and give them tips and strategies. And I say one way that you can have the conversation with your healthcare provider is for you to be able to express why that body part is important or meaningful to you, what it's meant to you. And that really, I think, in a way, allows it to be this more individual experience that you can connect with your patient on where they're coming from. We want to listen to the way a patient describe to me the way your body's been affected, right? I just talked about that in the last slide. Tell me how your body has changed. You want to listen to the description the patient provides. Were those changes expected or unexpected? What, are, what expectations do you have about future changes to your body? How much time are you spending thinking about body image changes? When are those thoughts coming up for you? What's triggering those thoughts? Obviously, we do a lot of cognitive behavioral work where we're wanting to understand the trigger, then we're on, wanting to understand the associated thought and the associated behavior. How much distress are you having around body image? When, when is that distress arising? What's bringing that on? How intense is the distress? Are you avoiding activities you used to do due to body image concerns? What activities are you avoiding? What would you be doing um, if you didn't have these concerns, right? I mean, example, I talk with patients all the time about not going swimming anymore with their grandchildren because they don't want to put on a bathing suit because they're so concerned about the body image changes. And we kind of talk about the implications of that. You can observe uh, their grooming behaviors or rituals. Are they engaging in excessive grooming? Are they avoiding grooming altogether? Are they avoiding mirrors? You want to ask those types of questions. You can also assess the degree to which they are engaging in reassurance seeking um, around body image with you, and you can also ask them about how that's playing out with their loved ones. And then, of course, there's a whole other area around sexuality and intimacy that's, that's tied to this, um, but as well, I, I, I will tell you that there's a lot of people who specialize specifically in addressing sexual sexuality, intimacy, sexual dysfunction, things like that. Um, I kind of address it as intimacy in relation to body image, but if there's really some more um, significant functional issues there, I will refer to another provider who has that specific area of expertise. So here's a poll. I want to know, what, which of these treatment modalities are you most likely use, are you most likely to use to address body image? And you can pick more than one. We're going to talk about some of these today. So I can see these 
even though we haven't ended the poll yet. And everybody's using some of these. Um, a lot of psychoeducation, a lot of CBT. Um, I mean, these are, these are the main things. Oh, I can't see it down at the bottom there. Okay. Looks to be a pretty um, advanced group of providers I have on this call because you're all familiar with obviously each of these modalities and you recognize the value I think and what they can do to help with body image as if that's what you're treating. So goal is okay. There we go. Um, Okay, so I'm hoping to get through as much of this as I can today. Um, as you might tell, I get very, um, very in invested and interested in this issue, and so I have lots of things I could talk about. Um, I hope to get through as much of it as I can. But these are the basics for me when I'm thinking about how to approach uh, treatment of body image issues. I want to figure out where a patient is. Are we really helping them facilitate treatment decisions related to body image? Are we helping them cope with recent body image changes or are we really at a phase where we're promoting longer term body image acceptance? Quite frankly, sometimes I have to do all three because as patients go through treatment, they may have more decisions they have to make as they go through with a new treatment modality or if they're going through reconstructive treatment, for example, with every phase of revision surgeries and things like that. So there's lots of different interventions that we can use at each of these, but you really wanna be mindful of which, which intervention you're using in this arena. So I'm having trouble moving forward. Okay. Oh, I went too far. Okay. So with facilitating treatment decisions, I would say that at the core of any intervention, and this is a powerful intervention, is normalizing and validating body image concerns. We need to do that throughout. We need to continuously provide those messages to our patients. Um, we often have to do a lot of work around goals and values clarification, exploring where body image goals and cancer treatment goals contradict one another and being able to help patients through that process. Um, that can be a really key thing that we do very well as psychosocial providers, that we can provide a very wonderful service to our, our medical colleagues if you have patients who are having trouble making treatment decisions and um, getting, you know, getting where they need to be um, from this perspective. I'm going to talk a little bit more about coping with uncertainty because that's a big part of what we do. And then, of course, being able to help continuously set flexible and realistic expectations for outcomes. Now, I don't put pressure on myself as a psychosocial provider to have to tell patients what to expect of how they're going to look or, or their medical outcomes because I am not on that medical side of things. I'm on the psychosocial side. I really want to focus more on what skills that they have to, a, to become flexible, like to not stay so rigid in this is, this is what they told me, this is how it's going to look or, you know, those types of things. These are conversations I continually have to have to have with patients about what skills do you have? How can you become more flexible and more realistic? You know, when a patient's going for surgery, I say to them, you have an image in your head of what you think this is going to look like. And, and unless you have like superpowers that you can predict the future, which you don't, you are not going to look like what you think you're going to look like, or the, the way this is going to feel is not what you're imagining or predicting. You don't have this predictive power. It's, it's either going to be better than you're thinking because you're catastrophizing and making this out to be this is going to be the worst thing in the world, or it's, you're, it's going to be worse than what you're thinking. And we need to kind of talk through those scenarios of what skills you have to address if it turns out better than you thought or it's worse than you thought and, what, you know, all of that piece. So my work on setting these expectations is not about educating them from a medical perspective. For that, I need to work directly with the medical team, maybe get some information from them that I can pass along to patients, but I don't take on that onus. Um, these are obviously the things that I kind of listen for at times with my patients. I want to, any, my little spidey sense goes up. Anytime I hear them talk about, well, I don't want to have any scars, or I, I want to look just as I did before, or I want to look better than I did before, or that's my expectation. Right? And I think that oftentimes we're working against the grain when, especially for a breast cancer survivor, as an example, people talk to our patients all the time, their friends and family, about, oh, you get your new boobs and aren't, you know, isn't that great? And, you know, all, you get your tummy tuck or whatever it is. We, we've heard all these things before. Um, talk, I, 
talk a lot with patients when they're talking about, well, I want another surgery to fix the way this looks or feels. Um, we have to address that. I just want normal sensations to return to my body. Um, it, it, a lot of this is asking patients about what skills they have for managing uncertainty. How have you faced other situations where your expectations weren't met? Maybe we take it out of a medical context and talk about this in other settings in their life. Um, and we also want to really explore this ideal that they have in their mind versus the reality of what they're dealing with. And that discrepancy and how that makes the patient feel and how that's affecting their lives. Um, of course, when we're talking about managing uncertainty related to treatment outcomes, we want to help identify what are some counterproductive strategies patients are engaging in, that internet searching, um, those, those uh, support groups which can be helpful or harmful depending on how much anxiety it's invoking for the patient. Um, and of course, just all of this framing around being able to leave space for both hope and fear, helping patients acknowledge the lack of control that they have and being able to allow their worries and anxieties to be as there are. We're not here to problem solve, right? Problem solving has a, has a role in certain areas for body image, but not here in terms of managing uncertainty. We really want to be able to help patients, um, especially on that piece of, of allowing their anxiety, identifying their emotions, sitting with their emotions. Um, those are really important. And identifying some healthy distractions for them as well. These are all different strategies that you would use. And when you get stuck with a patient sometimes, it's being able to come back to some of this. Um, coping with recent body image changes, this is, this is important. This is a, a big issue when there's a lot of acute distress around a recent body image change. I do a lot of work with patients on systematic desensitization to mirror viewing. I'm going to talk about that. Um, a lot around communication skills, problem solving in social situations, right? Not problem solving of what other interventions can we do to help make them look better, right? Not that piece, but problem solving around how do we get them back out in public doing things that they, that they would enjoy doing or getting back to living their daily lives. Um, and I would say with the systematic desensitization and mirror viewing, it all starts with a little bit of mind-body relaxation before we get into that, that piece of that, you know, gradual exposure. So here's preparing for mirror viewing. Here's some things I do like to talk about a lot with people is giving you some really specific strategies. And I developed like a tip sheet at MD Anderson that we would give out preoperatively to patients. Of course, it's first helping patients acknowledge their emotions. When you're getting ready to do this work, you want to do some um, practice relaxation and you want to get them to acknowledge their emotions. But we want to understand, we want to help tell patients that viewing their, their scars and viewing themselves after a surgery is, the, is an important first step in their recovery. We don't want them to delay or avoid viewing their scars because we all know about the relationship between avoidance and fear and how that just, the longer you avoid, you're strengthening the fear. Um, and we're wanting to provide that message that viewing your scars during early phases of recovery allows you, the patient, to more fully appreciate improvements in your appearance that will occur over time, right? I try to explain to patients there's so much healing that happens during the early postoperative phase that if you don't look till later, you won't be able to appreciate how much things have improved. So in that sense, even if they're not ready to look right away, I talk with them about maybe taking a picture or having somebody else take a picture and they can look at that picture later if they're not ready to look at it, if there's too much fear and anxiety, to be able to have that to help document the improvement in their outcomes over time that they can see. Um, we talk about patients getting a description from someone else about what it looks like if they're too um, uncomfortable with viewing things themselves, and that is something we can do as healthcare providers, providing that neutral, objective description of what it looks like to a patient. Um, talk about, and when I say take a picture, sometimes looking at that picture is, is much easier than them looking in a mirror itself. Um, I give people the advice that when they are first viewing themselves, they might want to dim the hospital lights or turn the lights off altogether and then gradually be able to look with more and more lighting because that harsh hospital lighting is certainly um, can be more difficult than being able to work your way up to that. Mirrors come in different shapes and sizes. I will give out a handheld small compact mirror like what you would have in your purse to put on lipstick. I have them branded um, with Finger at Psychology Services, and I give those out to my patients to say, you can look with a small mirror and look at a portion of the affected body part rather than looking at it certainly in a full-length mirror or a magnifying mirror. You don't want to start there. Use different types of mirrors and work your way up. I also tell people that sometimes just looking at um, the affected area with all the bandages on in the mirror 
is a first step, that that's a helpful first step. Because obviously you can't remove your bandages right away. This all has to be done with um, the approval of your healthcare providers when they can remove their bandages. Um, and then another thing we talk about is if they're really having difficulty with looking at um, an affected body part is being able to use their sense of touch. Um, we can learn about our bodies through our various senses, and some may find it helpful to feel their scars around the affected body part before looking at them, of course, getting medical clearance to do so. So there's a lot of ways we can do this. Um, coping with recent body changes, um, you know, I do a lot of guided imagery with patients, and that guided imagery to help get them more relaxed um, is, is helpful. We want to be able to help patients verbalize and process their reactions to mirror viewing, and in this case, we want to really be able to listen for biased, judgmental, and emotional descriptions and help patients um, shift towards the use of more objective, neutral language. I often tell people when they use those phrases, like, I look like a monster, or I'm a fat cow, or things like that, and I will say, um, I want you to explain this to me as if I didn't have the gift of sight. I don't know what a monster looks like. I don't, I, I don't know what a you know, I don't know what fat is. I want you to give me um, some, some things that I can understand better from that perspective. So we'll go through and continuously adjust that language to get rid of the biased, judgmental, and emotional descriptions. Um, that's really helpful um, to do over time. Um, so here's some other kind of things that I think help uh, us under, understand. I'm looking at the time here. I'm going to try to get through as much of this as I can. But these are the uh, appearance schemas that we hear from patients that um, are, are really, like, I will go through sometimes and just ask these five questions. And I'll say, how many of these do you think are true? Right? Physically attractive people are always better off. It's important to look my best at all times. Um, people will automatically notice what's wrong with my appearance. I would be happier if I could only, you know, lose five pounds, fix this part of my body. It is impossible for me to accept my changed appearance. Inevitably, when I'm working with patients with extreme body image issues, they will endorse every single one of these as absolute truths. And this provides a great um, framework for us to have discussions around some of this language, where obviously you're seeing the all or nothing, the always important to look my best at all times. And then we really use this to help challenge some of these thought patterns and really pick apart um, the nuances of this and the language um, and some the cognitive distortions that are within this. Okay, so um, this is something from uh, Thomas Cash's The Body Image Workbook. Um, I think it's called Eight Steps to Loving the Way You Look. I think it's what it's called, or Liking the Way You Look. It's not for cancer patients, but there's some really helpful things in there that, um, that I utilize with my patients. Um, and then, of course, it's really important for us to be able to problem-solve social situations. We want to challenge the all-or-nothing thinking, the mind reading, the fortune-telling. I do spend a large majority of my time doing that with patients and labeling when they're doing that. Um, I want to normalize and validate self-consciousness in social situations that it's okay and really encourage them to give themselves credit for the effort they're making when they're going out in public, even if they're uncomfortable. Um, do a lot of work around nonverbal communication strategies and paying attention to body language. That's really important. You know, I tell people, holding up your head high and looking people in the eye and nodding and smiling and eye contact and all of that can help you feel more confident. You know, we kind of talk about that fake it till you make it mentality. Um, helping patients be prepared for questions and comments, having a short story that they would, uh, you know, something they would say when people ask them if there is something noticeable about their appearance that's changed, um, how, you know, what they want to say about it. And then, of course, there's all these well-meaning comments about how great you look or, or you know, you look amazing or you look fantastic or you, you look like you're doing so well. And these comments can be very hard for patients to hear. So I talk with patients a lot about, the possibility of educating people around how comments on my appearance are not really helpful to me right now. Um, I would really prefer when you see me to talk about how great it is to be together. I'm so happy to see you. When you comment on how good I look, I'm having a hard time hearing that right now. You obviously have to be kind of vulnerable as a patient and have a certain relationship with that person to want to do that. So these are the other strategies I give my patients, obviously redirecting the conversation. Um, and then I tell them that sometimes just being able to accept the compliment is act, can actually also be very empowering for them, especially if they were at a point earlier where they couldn't accept that and now they might be able to accept that and move on. And sometimes it's having that internal mantra, right? I'm a work in progress. It's normal to feel self-conscious right now. Whatever that is, if they know they're going to go out into a social situation and they know they have a visible change to their appearance that may be commented on by someone else, is to be prepared for that when they're going into that situation. So we do a lot of that type of stuff. Um, 
hopefully I'll be able to get to some information here on body image acceptance, but I want a working definition to be coming to terms with the fact that there's aspects of your body that you like and that you don't like. I have to work with patients a lot on this. Body image acceptance does not mean having to like everything about your body or be completely accepting of everything, of the changes and, and enjoying it and appreciating it. That's not what body image acceptance is. Um, we talk about really having and developing unconditional care and respect for your body despite the changes that have occurred, despite the grief or the anger or the loss or the resentment you have is still having that respect for your body and being able to celebrate and recognize aspects of your body. You still enjoy that's important too. Um, and I think this goes without saying about coping with negative thoughts and feelings. So what I do oftentimes with patients to help promote body esteem is I really think about this in three buckets. I think about activities they might be able to plan that are really focused on appearance enhancing or sensory pleasing or health and fitness related activities. And we really get people to identify and plan those activities. Being able to stay mindful and present and being able to journal thoughts and feelings and connection to their body. These are ways we help people reconnect to their body when they're feeling a disconnect. And there's lots of ways that we can do this. The sensory pleasing is really important to think about because it's not something you have to do in a physically active way. You can be a passive recipient of a sensory pleasing experience, whether that's being outdoors, whether it's wearing soft, comfortable clothing, looking at a sunset, hugging someone, stargazing, listening to music. These are all ways that activate our senses and help us feel more grounded and connected to our bodies and can be done even during active treatment. Health and fitness doesn't have to be rigorous physical activity. It could be something like playing with your kids or your grandkids. We all know that that takes fitness and movement, right? Walking, meditating, dancing, gardening. There, there's ways you can be creative with this. So um, I encourage you to think about this as a potential activity you can do. Okay, I got to wrap it up because I at least want a few minutes for questions, but I had so much stuff I wanted to talk about. This is what I do. I provide these services. Um, I provide individual therapy for patients. And remember, I make sure to un underscore for mild, moderate, or severe body image disturbance. Um, and I also do a lot of speaking events, and I'm very passionate about educating patients around body image, supporting them, and also educating healthcare providers. I also am a SIPAC provider, so I do have the ability to do telehealth across all the states that are um, providing, uh, that are members of SIPAC. And then I guess what I'd like to do is kind of, I think this is rounding out what resources or support, this is supposed to be or support, do you believe would enhance your ability to provide enhanced body image care? I think this would be helpful to understand. This is like what I would say a little introductory session around body image that's really hitting some highlights and some fundamentals. But I firmly believe, and I do a lot of work with training in healthcare and education, that there's much more in-depth trainings that you can do around these topics. And that's something that I offer um, through, my, through my consulting practice and would love to hear the types of things that you believe would still help you in your practice. I'd love to share some responses. Looks like we have someone saying worksheets to give to patients, hands out to provide to patients that normalize body image concerns, access to consultation, in-person trainings where role playing is involved, more of exactly what you're doing now. So the specific examples of your interventions were very helpful for folks. Psychosocial education, uh, someone said, I would love a curriculum to use in a group setting, more active involvement in return to office visits and clinic. Um, I'd love a list of books to create uh, body image workshops. So just a couple in there, but lots of excitement around resources for body image. So I love all of that. Um, I'm excited to hear more as we get some of those responses in. And what I want to really do, let me see if I can I have a hard time advancing my slides after these. Um, I do want to take questions, and what I want to do is I really want to encourage you all to be able to connect with me. 
because this is the exact type of work that I am invested in doing. I ha do have some, I do have some handouts that I've developed um, that I am willing to share for people who want to contact me. Um, I do have some other trainings and other things that I offer and I'm continuing to develop and I'm also continuing to try to develop a collaborative network of individuals who are interested in body image work. So it's a really wonderful opportunity for people from all different disciplines. Um, I want you to know that I not only do this with psychosocial providers such as mental health professionals, but there's also a whole field of oncology aesthetic providers who do work on like wig selection and coping with scars, medical massage therapists. Um, there's a whole thing, a, a whole bigger field out there that we can all tap into and work together. So I'm very excited about that type of work. So I will leave it there. I probably went too long, but um, I do, we do have some time for some questions. We do have one question in the Q&A. Um, so this attendee anonymously said, I'm curious, given your experience with head and neck patients, how have you helped patients manage slash cope with their body image slash functionality who have had their tongue removed slash and all or sorry, and or all of their teeth removed? So a big part of working with this patient population, especially I would say for people who have speech impairment, is um, being able to take the time to allow them to have um, a way to express how it's all affecting them. And it's, it's work that takes more time because you have to be very patient as patients, you know, whatever speech assisted device they're using um, is really sitting with them. I would say just a few things is letting them have that opportunity and not kind of jumping in to try to help speak for them or interpret for them, right? Is they, they, I think too many people in their lives try to help them do that. I will say that I think for that those patient populations, I've also found these support groups to be extremely helpful for them to be in a room with other people um, who've gone through that. There's been, um, you know, uh, trying to remember SPOHNC, support for people with head and neck cancer is one of the organizations I know that does things like that. Um, I found that group to be very impactful. And it was me, we, we had a, a group that we used to run at MD Anderson that was actually a, a collaboration between myself and the speech pathologist. And we worked together um, with these patients to put them in a group setting and talk with them. But I don't know that I would approach a lot of these body image interventions that I am suggesting actually go across these different patient populations. Um, so I, I don't know that it's, I do very different things for head and neck than I do for breast or other patients. It's just trying to figure out what that, that challenge is for the patient. How, how is it affecting their day-to-day -day lives? Are they, are they not going out and doing things they used to enjoy? I think also when it comes to the issues with, with eating and, and speech, um, there's a lot more that you need to do around those social situations, those social settings, right? Eating is such a um, place where people come and gather socially, and how do you address it? We spend a lot more time talking about that and how a patient wants to navigate that. So it's tricky, but um, I, I would say that it's long-term work. This is really not short-term work. Um, there can be things done short-term that help patients feel more supportive in those moments, but it's just, I think that also depends on whether you have a longer time to work with patients or whether you're doing really short-term work, figuring out your goals and how you can deal with that. Thank but you. I'm not suggesting it's easy work. Thank you. We are at the end of our time together. I did see one more Q&A question come in, but unfortunately we do need to kind of wrap things up here. So um, Dr. Fingeret, thank you so much for being with us today. As a reminder, this session was recorded and will be available for viewing on CSC's Zoom Events Hub and on CSC's Learning and Training Program website through February 10th of 2025. PDF versions of the presentation materials, including slide decks, handouts, et cetera, will be shared with attendees following the event. Please note that all session recordings and resources available after the event are for informational purposes only and will not be available for CEs. If you wish to receive one continuing education credit from participating in this session, you must complete an online evaluation form. The link to this form will be made available after every session, but please note that you will need to fill it out once. You only need to fill it out once to claim credits, excuse me. If you have questions about the CE activity, please contact Prime at the email that is shared in the chat. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this session. Our expo will be open shortly at 1.15, so right now. 
Please join us and visit our sponsor, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and our CSC booths, the MyLifeline.org booth and the Cancer Support Helpline booth um, during our 30-minute break here. To access the expo, please click on Expo button at the top bar once you're back into the lobby. Um, Zoom will provi provide a tutorial on how to interact with the booths if it is your first time in the expo. We look forward to having you all at our next session discussing the 2025 changes in Medicare M3P and what the health equity and policy implications are in the next 30 minutes at 1.45 p.m. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.